Folks, thank you very much for joining us here at CSIS. My name is Tom Sanderson. I'm the director of the Transnational Threats Project. To my left is Jennifer Cook, the director of the Africa program. We will do introductions in just a moment, but let me point out our emergency exits. For those of you who came up the stairs, of course, that serves as one down the stairs to the left and out to the right. If you head out these doors and to the left, on the right-hand side of the elevators is a second exit, and I believe out the back door here on the left side is a third exit. So just look for me, Jennifer, Caleb Johnson, my deputy who's over here on the left, Maria Galperin in the back in the black dress um, for any assistance that you may need. Um, we're very happy to host you here this afternoon. Um, this is the conclusion of a report and project that has been in a, a year in the making uh, that included some fantastic field work that Jennifer and I were able to do in Senegal, Mali, Nigeria, and Niger. Uh, Jennifer and I will lay out the objectives of the project, the findings, go through some of the uh, field work um, engagements, and then we will turn it over to Q&A on that element of the presentation, and then we will turn it over to our guests uh, that you see here today, Madeline Rose on the far left, Najla al Mangush next to her, next to me, Fatima Esquera, who is here from Maiduguri, Nigeria, and then Benjamin Nichols. And uh, I believe you all have their bios, so we won't uh, take up any time in, in reading through those. But nonetheless, a uh, great um, set of guests here with tremendous expertise who will both comment on what Jen and I present, and then we'll have their own comments to make about the work that they are doing. Uh, with that, why don't we jump right into it? Just uh, one example here of the field visit. This is uh, the Gao airfield <clears throat> from inside the uh, bullet-ridden building that's being used for the United Nations flights up to UN Super Camp in, uh, in Mali. Next, please. Just a short video to lay out the background of the project. Right, do we have the uh, next slide. up here? Next slide. Who's, uh, where's the slide? Uh, Just one moment. Where is it? Oh, okay, so sorry, I didn't see that. While much of the world focuses on terrorism in the Middle East, violent extremist groups have expanded their ambitions and reach in Africa as well. In the Western The security vacuum in Libya and the presence of Islamic State and Al-Qaeda deepen the risks to the Sahel region. There has been a lot of turmoil and trouble with these radical elements which you find in this arc of instability from North Africa to Afghanistan. Military intervention by regional forces, France and the UN, have weakened these groups and reclaimed territories they once held. But the drivers of militancy and the complex social, economic, and political environment that fuels these groups remain very much intact. Unless this understructure of vulnerability and criminality is addressed, extremist violence will remain an enduring threat to the region. On that website, you'll be able to find the full report, that video, an executive summary, a podcast, uh, as well as a photo album from uh, field visits. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, the complete report, which is available there. Okay, let me provide a little bit of context as to the Sahel study. Several years ago, our Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS created the Arc of Instability Project to look at trends in militancy across this region in the west from Senegal to Bangladesh in the east, and we divided into three sections, South Asia completed in 2013, the Middle East and North Africa completed a year and a half ago, and now the Sahel study being completed today. And the point was to look at key strategic trends, changes in militant groups across this region, the underlying causes, the groups themselves, their ideology, structure, financing, and operations, and then to look at government responses to them and to offer recommendations on how to improve those responses. We did that in cooperation with our Homeland Security Group, with our Middle East Group, and now with the Africa Group. 
And what you have before you is the conclusion of those three phases. We do plan to consider other areas, including Central Asia and uh, other parts of the world. Um, and today we'll be focusing on the one on the right, and that is the hard copy uh, cover of the Sahel study, in the middle is the MENA study, and on the left is the South Asia study. And those are all available on the TNT website, Transnational Threats website, at CSIS.org. This is the area represented by the arc of instability, though people define it in different ways. It can go down into Southeast Asia, an area that we've covered in great detail, Indonesia, um, Philippines, Malaysia, and other parts of the region. So the Sahel region, this is the project that we have before us today. What we're looking at are a number of factors. One, what is the landscape of actors in this region, a violent extremist organization? Who's active, who's local, who's tied to larger regional groups, who's tied to international groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS? Looking at some of those memberships and alliances, we understand they're quite fluid. They shift quite a bit. As Jen and I met with a number of folks up in Gao and other places, they said, look, you can't possibly have this many uh, militants in the region. We know people are putting on one hat, taking off another, joining groups out of survival, out of opportunity. And so the notion that uh, memberships and alliances are very fluid and changing all the time. Trafficking is a core element of what we're looking at in terms of underlying conditions that enable violent extremist organizations and contribute to the instability and the low levels of human security in the region. A lot of criminal networks and a lot of participation at official levels in some of these trafficking networks, which points to the heart of the problem, one of the parts of those problems, and that, of course, is corruption. Uh, again, part of the goal of this project is to inform um, long-term solutions to some of these seemingly intractable problems that you have there. And another key element was to look at what was flowing out of Libya at the time of Gaddafi's overthrow and over the last five years. Uh, which you all know has been a large number of weapons, individuals moving back and forth over trafficking networks in Mali, Niger, Chad, but people being brought up from even lower than that, from Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and other parts of West Africa. Um, so we, th we don't want to go fully into the book. We have a great panel here today, and we want to um, save plenty of time for them. ...about a few of the key themes uh, of the report. Um, the first one is that although we, we've, it's, it's violent extremism has, that has drawn much of the world's attention uh, to the Sahel and to northeast Nigeria, uh, really... Uh, Violent extremism is not happening in a vacuum. And to address violent extremism, you're going to have to address the structural drivers that have facilitated its rise, uh, the political economy factors that have facilitated it, and the local dynamics that perpetuate it. And those are very different uh, in different countries, in different regions, and really even almost in local, uh, very local settings. And so in a report like this, it's almost impossible to capture that. That was one of the dilemmas of this report. Um, but we offer a few examples of how very localized rivalries, competitions, alliances um, affect uh, and uh, facilitate violent extremism. Um, the structural drivers are often, uh, you know, talked about uh, in terms of climate change, in terms of demographic growth, in terms of uh, uh, loss of arable land or water sources that are, uh, that are creating pressures for resources. Um, you have uh, lively, traditional livelihoods being undermined, uh, increasing tensions, and we've seen this a lot in, in just recent years, between uh, nomadic groups and sedentary uh, farmers. Uh, as they compete over uh, uh, diminishing resources and diminishing livelihood opportunities. Um, so we, we know about those. It, it's important, though, to note that in the, in the areas that these groups have, have arisen, the poverty and, and those kinds of the education and the basic indicators are much worse than in the rest of the national country. So if you look, they are you're looking at a lot of poor countries. Niger is quite poor, Mali is quite poor, Chad. But the regions like Diffa region uh, along Lake Chad or Lac region along in on Lake Chad or Yobe and Borno 
um, in northeast Nigeria are among the poorest in those particular countries. So it's not just that, that the countries are poor, these regions are the poorest uh, uh, within them. They are also among the most isolated and kind of insulated from the national discourse. I was looking up access to media of any kind, whether radio, print, television, extremely low. 98% never in, in DIFA, never see a, a TV, listen to a radio, get online, whatever, what have you. So very isolated kind of from the national political discourse, from the national economy, um, and, and from market links that might bring them into the country. A lot of the trading in those, in those areas happens across the borders. So they look for their partners across the borders to family, trading partners, uh, ethnic uh, counterparts, and so forth. In Gao, for example, most of the foodstuffs in Gao markets are not, do not come up from Bamako. Uh, they come down from Algeria, smuggled, uh, because they're, they're subsidized there. Niger was interesting in that way, and it, you know, Niger has kind of been a bit more resilient in the face of you know, the incoming Tuareg and some of these issues. And you know, it would be interesting to explore whether this is because the Nigerian government actually has a greater stake than, uh, than some other governments in that north. There's uranium mines there, it has a much bigger uh, Tuareg population. There's much more connectivity uh, between Niamey and Agadez, for example. And are those kinds of market links and that create social links along with them, are those something that we should be thinking about when we're trying to address fragility in some of these states? Um, on the governance deficit, there's this, this very centralized state versus the marginalized uh, periphery where the state does not often have a lot of interest or incentive uh, to put political or economic goods um, out to the periphery. Uh, in Mali, 10% of the population is, is in the north. Uh, very little of the, GDP, the country's GDP comes from the north. The big mines, the big export earners are in the south. Uh, and many Malians call the south Mali utile, so useful Mali. Uh, the opposite of which is you know, useless Mali is, is whatever is north of Mopti, essentially. Um, you, you have similar in Nigeria, big thriving economy in the south of the country. The northeast, which has always been something of an opposition stronghold, and not, not tied into the patronage of the ruling party, uh, is likewise isolated. So the political dynamics at a national level about why these regions have been so consistently marginalized is important to understand as well. Then the third thing, this local political economy, extremist organizations are just one of many armed groups and violent groups that have grown up with these structural drivers and this government deficit. Uh, you have ethnic and local militias, you have uh, drug traffickers, you have arms dealers, criminal networks, uh, armed groups that in Mali, for example, that are, that are now um, uh, negotiating at the po at political table. Um, you have area boys, Boko Haram began as, as essentially a, a, a fairly isolated sect, but really became militarized when the local governor used them as kind of a protection intimidation force in elections. That's when they first uh, were armed. So all of this, this kind of infrastructure and understructure of insecurity and conflict, you have to take into account. And you can't just uh, pick violent extremists out of that and think you've managed the problem. As Tom said, if you, if you press on one, uh, on, on violent extremist groups, they'll often meld back into another group. So you'll have someone who is, say, a local authority, who is a financier, um, who gets his money from local drug trafficking, who is a financier of Mujao. Uh, but when they come under pressure, he then moves to Gatia, which is the political group that is now in negotiation for, for the national piece of the pie. And you have these people switching hats and overlapping and intersecting. And that's, uh, I think, one of the strengths and one of the resiliences of, of, of some of these groups. Uh, what are the priorities for addressing uh, extremists in the Sahel? Well, I guess we'll go forward with one slide. I think in the immediate term, there are the two, two immediate priorities. Uh, the first is to protect civilians, uh, uh, make civilian protection a priority. 
these groups have been weakened. Boko Haram is kind of on the back foot. It's been squeezed into fairly marginal areas. But both groups continue to launch really devastating asymmetrical attacks. And those kind of attacks are, are much harder to guard against than some of the more sophisticated, uh, bigger attacks. We in this country have not been able to guard against them. France has not been able to guard against them. Belgium has not. These are very hard, difficult, uh, without intelligence, without mobility, um, to guard against uh, in, a, in an area that is so vast and where security capacities are so low. So uh, kind of information, a, a flow of information between communities and security forces to allow rapid response, early warning uh, will be critical. But we also have a massive crisis in the northeast of, of Nigeria right now in the Lake Chad Basin uh, with millions at risk of starvation, uh, polio reemerging as uh, access to health services have been completely shut down. Uh, kids who have not been to school now for years because uh, uh, education schools have been shut down. Um, and there you have the makings of your next disaster a generation down the line. And so we think the, the response right now should be a humanitarian response, but we should be also be thinking of this um, as laying the ground for the next crisis uh, when, it, when it comes. Education is, is absolutely critical in that. Um, then we, we, we often talk about the longer term security or the, the longer term approach that requires investments in agriculture, investments in infrastructure, uh, creating employment, microfinance to get businesses going again. And yes, those are all very important to do and they should be started with urgency. I think one of the worries for this uh, is that, uh, you know, when it's when things are insecure and there's a security threat out there, it's very hard to begin with, to begin them. And when the security threat subsides, the motivation to do these things also subsides. So they'll be important to follow through. Then on the groups themselves, very important that we not allow them to regroup, uh, rebuild, and come back stronger. They've done that in the past and we've seen it happen. In that regard, uh, you have to have countries of the region collaborating effectively and closely so that they do not simply uh, slip over a border up into Libya, for example, or out until the security situation uh, calms and then move back in creating the problem all over again. So regional coordination has to be uh, strong and it has to be sustained over time. Uh, similarly, uh, tracking down, building the institutions and the capacities to track down and disrupt financing flows for these groups is very important. And that's something that there hasn't been as much effort on, uh, particularly I'd say in the Lake Chad region, region in, in tracking down exactly who is funding these groups. Um, and finally, uh, in order to prevent these groups from, re, uh, from regenerating, you have to provide an off-ramp for some of the fighters uh, who have surrendered or who have been captured or who are debating whether to surrender, who may feel stuck uh, within the group uh, but cannot surrender for fear of getting killed or thrown into one of the horrific prisons there. Um, this is a huge challenge simply because you have to sort out levels of culpability, who is, you know, who is a hard, hardline ideologue, who is in there for economic gain, uh, who got kidnapped and then indoctrinated. There may be young men who weren't of age when they were first pulled in. Uh, and there are many, many uh, we know in Boko Haram who were simply coerced uh, to join the group. So sorting out culpability of these people while providing justice and accountability for the victims of Boko Haram and their families, that's gonna be a tricky uh, political balance there. I know I'm talking a little bit too long. That's right. No, keep going. But uh, just uh, just to say, you know, why uh, why should we keep our eye on this ball? The, the you know the the situation has calmed somewhat from from the crisis level where these groups held territory. Um, again, these groups have proved extremely resilient in the past. They have fractured and realigned in in ways and come back even stronger, more experienced, and more. 
uh, violent than, in, than previously. That happened after the death of Mohammed Yusuf in, in Nigeria. Um, and we saw just recently AQIM, after a period of uh, quiescence, uh, launching spectacular attacks in uh, Grand Bassam, in Ouagadougou, and in Bamako, uh, trying to ma make, itself, make itself known. Um, we, as these groups come under pressure, uh, we think that the, the incentives for collaborations among them, there will be fracturings and we'll, we'll see that. And rivalries can be difficult as they compete for no notoriety to say, look, no, I'm more deadly. Uh, and, and as I said, the Grand Bassam attacks, there's a little bit of that in that. Uh, but alliances can be equally dangerous. Um, you have AQIM, uh, AQ and ISIL now present in Libya. Uh, and the incentives to deepen ties with affiliates, uh, between affiliates and those groups uh, may deepen as well. AQ and ISIL will be looking for an expanded reach and presence. They'll be looking for recruits. They'll be looking for kind of a global network and a, or a safe haven, and local affiliates can provide that. Local affiliates will be looking for branding that ups them into the international game, uh, and, uh, and so linkages with those groups will, will give them that. You know, I think one of the worst fears we have is what happens in Libya, and we have someone to talk about Libya. When, if, when that is settled, does it spill out into the broader Sahel? Does it bring with it fighters and arms, but it, does it also bring this competition between ISIL and Al-Qaeda uh, into the region, which behind it are competitions between uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and, and much bigger geopolitical forces at play? What you don't want is the Sahel to become this kind of proxy battleground uh, for these large global and geopolitical forces. Uh, the states of the region are nowhere near having the capacities or the commitment uh, to deal with them. I'll stop there. And Tom, I think you're going to talk about just the last. Uh, OK, did, we have this? did you hit that one? Yeah. OK. okay. Right. Thank you, Jen. So the frequent question is, what are America's interest in this region, clearly promoting stability, development, um, diplomatic efforts, economic activity are tremendously important in this area. Nigeria, one of the largest economies, um, I think it is the largest economy in, in Africa, is clearly important to us. Uh, we have diplomatic relationships with all of these countries. We have violent extremist organizations that are moving from these countries up into North Africa. There's quite a number of interests that we have on the table there. but not enough resources, I believe, or I, I'm sure Jen believes as well. But nonetheless, um, with promotion of stability, human rights, economic development, these are all core and key concerns for the United States and our partners and allies, and therefore is what we believe is um, at, at stake here. Um, let me see if there's anything else here. No, nope, I think we're on to the next one. Okay, if you have any questions online, please tweet them in at underscore CSIS underscore threats or at CSIS Africa. I think at this point we're going to move to our other speakers, or if people want to ask questions about the report itself, you can ask those questions throughout the uh, Q&A session that falls at the end. We'll start with Ron Marks. Let, hold on, let's wait for a, a microphone. It's for the web audience. Hi, Ron Marks. I'm on the board here. Uh, quick question, I guess for you, Jennifer. Uh, for those of us who spend some time around the State Department, there have been a number of cables, a number of reports um, on the subject of the Sahel turning in the Sahara. Uh, in fact, that it, it was becoming increasingly difficult for people in an agricultural system to work there. How much impact has that been having on the radicalization of that area? Uh, it's, I mean, it's very hard to make that direct link, but you could you could see through a couple of, of steps uh, the idea that competition over resources uh, escalates and land and, and resources. Um, uh, extremism as a as a kind of a mobilizer uh, is, and there are many other mobilizers in the Sahel, um, could become kind of a mantle to mobilize supporters and so forth. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say climate change then creates radicalism, but it certainly can deepen communal tensions. And so much of this, and I think this is what really struck Tom and I, so much of this arises out of communal 
communal tensions with various groups taking on labels of convenience almost um, to mobilize their followers, to up their social standing and their social legitimacy, um, to, to get the edge in controlling the mechanisms of power and resources. So whether it's drug traffickers um, or ethnic militias hearkening back to the ethnic identity or Tuareg, uh, you know, uh, pushing back on a higher class Tuareg clan, or, and this has happened in, in West Africa for you know, cent centuries, you know, ambitious individuals using the language of jihad to get their followers riled up behind them. Um, I think you know, that kind of conflict, extremism emerges out of that. So it's not a one, two step, but it, it creates uh, that understructure of insecurity into which extre extremism um, can thrive. But let me touch on something you did bring up, Jen, and that is the impact of climate change in the environment on this. No, it is not a direct uh, causation, but when you do have changes in climate and interruption in economic activity that puts people out of work, you then have idle hands, and these are people who are prime candidates for recruitment and often have little choice but to join a group that offers them some level of economic activity and protection, or microloans, as we've seen with Boko Haram, that draws people in and traps them into these organizations. So it does make a, an impact in certain areas. Just a fact that stunned me was that Lake Chad has shrunk uh, by 95% since the 1960s. And all the fishing and jobs and, and uh, grazing that goes on with that. Just please, please wait for the microphone and please identify yourself and your affiliation. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Fatima Matake. I'm from the National Guard Bureau International Affairs. My question is uh, for Jennifer. I know you have identified the regional, the local, and the structural um, issues that are related to violent extremism in the Sahel. Um, is uh, uh, often um, times we when we talk to the actors in the region, they don't look at it just from the internal um, you know view or from the internal angle. They look at it from a more broader view um, that links it more to some Western foreign policies that happened back in the day and um, are still causing some types of uh, you know uh, like second, third, and fourth degree uh, uh, you know things in, in that region. Um, and I want to probably uh, talk here about um, the French, uh, France Afrique, uh, you know, policy, uh, policies and, um, you know, the ethnic problems and um, all the stuff that happened uh, during colonialism. I know a lot of us here are trying to move away from that, uh, you know, from that vision and uh, from what happened in the past to kind of just look at the real um, economic and political issues that are happening over there, but we uh, also need to look back at the historical facts and also the modern and the new things that are happening and the policies that are, you know, shaping some of those, uh, you know, things that happen in, in the Sahel. So would you please give us just a quick view on what you think about that? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's an important point because I think as Americans we tend to have short memories um, and in many parts of the world uh, memories are extremely long. I mean if you look at a group like uh, AQIM, you could arguably, and this is said in the report, argue that it is uh, you know, the product of a thwarted democratic process. Um, an Islamist group was poised to win what the international community deemed a fair, free and fair election. Uh, and then the election was annulled, and that party kind of uh, moved towards a more military stance. It's a great simplification, um, but you know the 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 root myth of AQIM was this disenfranchisement by the corrupt Algerian and and the French colonial power. So, um, you know, we we have to think about that. You know, I heard in Madugri um, from the guys from the Joint Task Force, who were not anti-American, I would not say by any means, but, um, you know, you, started, you know, the U.S. and their Cold War policies and funding those who were not concerned with good governance and so forth. So there are, you know, our actions in who we support and who we partner with, people remember those 
decades later. And so, I mean, I think that's a bit of a lesson for how we engage with security partners who are not the best uh, Democrats today. And I, mean, I think there's, there's, there's still lessons to be drawn on how to get that balance right of speaking both to U.S. values on democracy and in security partnerships. Um, but yes, there, is, there are elements of that uh, that you hear. I tend to think um, that it is kind of the more, more daily, those give kind of a founding myth to it and a backdrop, but I think it's the daily competitions uh, that are probably the most direct drivers of, of what's happening. I don't think you can attribute them all back to the one source of colonial occupation, for example, but it does provide a founding myth for them. And one with, and with, with some truth to it, too. Yes, ma'am. I feel like we should, uh, we can. Thank you, I'm Musu Clements. I'm a technical director at MSI, but before that I was the chief of party for the Peace Through Development II program in Niger, Burkina, and Chad. I'm looking forward to reading your report. You've mentioned some of the structural drivers of extremism. I wonder, in your field work, did you drill down at the individual level? Because within those structural drivers, not everyone is a terrorist, not everyone is engaged in violent behavior. So I'm fascinated by the emerging research about the individual motivations within these structural drivers. And just wondered if you could say anything about that. And I'll, I'll read the report, of course. Of course, everyone has their individual story and everyone has their own way of interpreting what they see in the field. Um, my own perspective is that many people driven into these groups are, while they're largely young men, these are men who are marginalized economically, socially, politically, culturally, within their own culture, countries, within their own communities. Some are driven by ideology, some are driven by the promise of uh, divine sanction on certain actions that they carry out with the, within these groups, but I think most of these are young men on the margins of society or in the, the, the middle of society, but they do not have opportunity, a sense of purpose, dignity, respect, no sense of mobilization, um, no prospects for the future or poor prospects for the future. And then that is manipulated by leaders of some of these groups who do have an extremist ideology who are able to effectively point to sources of the frustration that these young men are experiencing. And that's a very effective and potent mix. And that's something I've seen across the 60 plus countries I've done field work in. And we did not interview any militants in this field visit, but I've interviewed dozens of them. And I see the same conditions all over. And I'll tell you, a lot of them come back to poor government, uh, corrupt government, uh, economic dislocation, unemployment, underemployment, um, lack of education. So there's a whole raft of contributing factors here. And Jennifer will have her own perspective on this. No, I, I think that's right. But I, uh, I think if we move to the panel, uh, Mercy Corps has done a lot of great interviews with former fighters, with non-fighters, kind of. Uh, and there's some additional work that ISS has been doing in East Africa. Kind of what, what causes one young person to go down one route and one young person to go down the other? Is it a matter of, of families? Is it a matter of their peers and so forth? And so I think there's a lot still to be learned on how that actually happens uh, at the individual level. But should we go to our um, panel? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because we I think some of these panel. questions are starting to, you know, I'm yeah. sure that uh, Ben can answer some of them yeah. as well. Yeah, Ben, we decided we'll start off with you, so go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, I'll just mention, you just mentioned, Jennifer, that ISS has done some interesting research in East Africa on this question about individual motivations. There's a report from August 2016 about, um, based on interviews with 60 former members, I think, of, um, of what I think they call jihadi groups in Mali and talk about the different um, motivations for those. So there's some interesting research that's starting to emerge. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. I'm honored to be here. Um, what I'd like to use my um, brief time for here in my opening remarks is to really comment um, with some detail on the report itself, and then maybe evoke a couple themes that might merit some collective reflection among all of us gathered um, today. Before beginning, I should mention that I'm coming from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, 
ACSS, which is a congressionally mandated think tank and security cooperation agency that's focused on African security um, and is located at the National Defense University. That said, uh, my words here today are my own views, um, not those of ACSS, uh, NDU, or the United States government. Uh, my remarks are based on my own research, uh, trips to the, to the region, and engagement with defense and security uh, professionals. So to the report, and that's really what I want to use my time to, to talk about. I had a chance to read an advanced copy, um, so I'll just kind of give you a reader's um, perspective on it. So as a reader, uh, before hearing Jennifer and, and uh, Tom's presentation today, I took the report to be making four main points. Uh, the first is that in recent years, the Sahel has experienced a rapid rise in the scope of operations and devastation caused by terrorism, which has expanded sometimes even in the face of government responses. Second point, that terrorism is powerful and persistent in the region due to several factors, and that we need a robust political economy analysis of the Sahel's layered context in order to really understand these causes. So some of them have been evoked so far, structural drivers, economic, environmental, demographic drivers, political governance, fragility, so the report talks about corruption, weak institutions, center periphery dynamics, and overlapping networks. So there are many armed actors with varied interests. The report talks about what it calls a kaleidoscope of players. Traders, smugglers, traffickers, rebels, militias, self-defense groups, and so on. The third point is that terrorist groups are part and parcel of this elaborate Sahelian context. So like the other groups, like these other networks, ter uh, uh, terrorists work in networks of factions and splinters. Um, which are really clustered around, they identify as two core groups, Boko Haram and, and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or AQIM. Terrorists also benefit from the same drivers or are sustained by those same drivers. And the report argues they are likely to persist due to rejuvenating alliances, global ties, Libya's instability, and an expanding area of operations. And then the fourth major point that I took from the report is that government responses need improvement. Sahel nations need to overcome their ambivalence toward taking up the, the counter-terrorist fight, their over-reliance on military solutions, and their apathy toward making necessary governance reforms. The report also talks about the need regionally and internationally for responses to surpass rivalries and achieve greater coherence. And then it ends by talking about the United States government's stakes and role, saying that the U.S. should be vigilant because terrorism in the Sahel could become a direct and significant threat for the U.S. and its interests. So the U.S. should work now to do a handful of things. It should support regional cooperation. It should encourage the rule of law and protection of civilians. It should counterbalance military assistance with development aid and it should promote good governance generally in the Sahel. So that's what I took um, reading the report as the main points. Now, overall, um, I found myself to be in broad agreement with these central points. I think the report offers a succinct and accurate overview of the region's security landscape, and I think it deserves praise for um, a couple particular strengths. Um, I think this report is right to call for more granular analysis of the region. The text says at one point, gesturing toward vast, ungoverned spaces filled with terrorists just isn't enough. Or maybe I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what it says, right? Um, I think the report is also right to emphasize the complexity of non-state actors in the Sahel. Lines are blurred between the region's terrorist and non-terrorist groups. I think that term militancy in the title is a felicitous word choice because it acknowledges this. Uh, violent non-state actors do work at times in concert, at times in competition, one with another. And key ethnic groups like the Tuareg, the Fulani, are internally fragmented and politically divided. I think that gets it right. Then I also think the report is right to highlight some underappreciated features of um, human insecurity that's related to terrorism. So it talks about the displacement of millions of, of people uh, from these conflicts and the disastrous consequences of that. It laments a broken criminal justice system 
and really a rudimentary prison system in many of these places. And I think this is important. It hints at what are really some terrifying prospects of terrorism tapping into pastoralist violence in the region. In addition to enjoying these strengths when reading the report, um, I think the report adds some new information and sparks new reflections. I think it was useful to read the words of many different actors from the region. About a third of the report's citations in the version, the earlier version that I read, came from interviews. And these interviews are conducted with analysts, professors, journalists, politicians, military officers, officials from the Sahel governments, from the African Union, from the UN, with aid workers, activists, business people, and in some occasions with ordinary residents um, of the region. I thought the interviews with commanders of Nigeria's Civilian Joint Task Force, or CJTF, were particularly um, interesting. I also think that uh, through this report, we see how important it is to really kind of consider specific examples of deal-making and rivalries. The report talks, for example, about the former Borno State Governor Ali Modu Sharif and his alleged complicity with the Boko Haram founder Mohamed Yusuf and his alleged collusion with um, uh, Chad's government now. It also covers um, some leadership rivalries and disputes within Boko Haram between Abu Bakr Shekau and Khalid al-Barnawi. And it de details um, some of the national rivalries. It goes into detail about Nigeria and Chad's relationship, which is interesting. We often think about Nigeria and Cameroon. Uh, but it goes into detail about some of the national rivalries there in the response to Boko Haram. And then the last thing I'll say is that there were a couple lines in the report, at least the version I read, that I think give pause and uh, generate some reflection. So I'll paraphrase a couple um, statements or ideas that I found in the report. Um, don't know how they ended up in the final version, but uh, something like this was in the initial report, and I, th it, I think gives pause for reflection. One was this. Uh, in West Africa, Islam spread more quickly with the French colonial conquest than in all previous centuries. Another statement I found was, in the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin, unfortunately, attacks on local populations have become almost too routine to garner global headlines. Another statement was, any effort seeking to eliminate extremism without also tackling these other networks of criminal enterprises, ethnic militias, armed groups, corrupt government officials, will ultimately fail. Personally, I'm not sure I would subscribe to, without qualification at least, to any one of those specific statements, but they all made me think, and I think it's um, interesting points for reflection. Now let me turn to a couple areas where I think the report might have done a bit more, uh, in my view. First is committing to the local focus. Uh, the report tries to apply its analysis to a wide area of Africa, perhaps a little too wide. Um, early on, the report delineates in some detail a few specific geographic areas that it will cover. But that said, in practice, uh, the report starts to glide between the terms Sahel, Lake Chad Basin, West Africa. Um, it seems to want to include Libya, but the analysis isn't really elaborated um, there. And it gestures sometimes even toward this larger arc of instability that seems to stretch all the way to Somalia or maybe beyond. And I sometimes thought that these broad brushstrokes and the decision to put AQIM, Boko Haram, the Libya crisis all into one lens uh, can seem a bit like a stretch. And I also thought it tended to run contrary to one of what I thought was the strongest points made by the report, namely that terrorism persists through the many particular local dynamics and histories, all of which required more nuanced study. And then a second um, point that, that might um, bear reflection or reconsideration. Explaining why now. Uh, the report, to my mind, doesn't make a, a great deal of effort to explain the reason for the rise of terrorism um, in the region right now. It opens by describing terrorism's rapid ascent in the Sahel, and it then explains terrorism's strength through some age-old factors, structural drivers, governance deficits, uh, violent non-state actors, so on. But these challenges have existed for decades. In some cases, they've existed for centuries. So what changed? Why now? 
why has terrorism suddenly become such a problem, or why has it grown across the last years or maybe decade? The report does mention what it calls the toxic Libyan spillover. But in my mind, while Libya may have been an accelerant to both AQIM and Boko Haram and its violence, both those groups clearly preceded the Arab Spring in that crisis. So the question why now remains, I think it's a hard one, and it's one that um, I think the report might have taken on more directly. Let me conclude then with just a few broad themes that I thought emerged from the report, broader than just the report, that I think might merit some reflection among all of us uh, this afternoon. The first one has to do with border security. As I read the report, it seemed to me that all types of trafficking um, were described as extensively interconnected and having uh, negative effects on the region. Um, yet Sahelian defense and security professionals that I work with pretty regularly um, often argue for decriminalizing everyday community cross-border illegal trade, things like foodstuffs, fuel, and so on, and just focusing law enforcement attention exclusively on transnational organized criminals who are conducting illicit trafficking in drugs, trafficking in persons, these kind of big ticket dangerous items. They also sometimes argue for creating free trade zones along borders to reduce the incentives of, of smuggling subsidized goods, right, and making money off that margin. So what would realistic and effective border management look like in the Sahel? It's a bigger theme that kind of came out of the report. Second is humanitarian assistance. Uh, the report recommends that the government, U.S. government, expand development programs such as food aid, in part because these programs naturally align with regional government's interests. However, my impression is that not all regional governments are prepared to admit the scale of the humanitarian crisis that they're facing or their own need for external help in responding. Also, the kinds of things talked about, like food shipments for IDPs, internally displaced persons, to my mind are not really development aid. They're more like humanitarian assistance. And this is the kind of short-term immediate fix, through, sometimes through direct action, that is sometimes necessary, but can also in the long run risk undermining genuine development. It's actually kind of the development world's uh, analogous uh, problem for military solutions that can in the long run undermine uh, genuine emergence of security. So how should external partners effectively advocate for and calibrate humanitarian assistance? It's another big issue that seems to come out of the report. Then the last one has to do with peace support operations. I think the report accurately points out that MINUSMA and Operation Bahan have different aims and that they lack full coordination. However, I think the clear need for both of those missions highlights a new reality that is often facing peacekeeping in Africa, namely that peacekeeping operations now often take place in an environment where there's terrorism. Somalia is, is, is another example of this. So another kind of larger question might be, how should the international community be shaping mandates, updating trainings, and so on, in order to deal with this new reality? So those are some of my um, responses to, the, to having the chance to read that report in advance. And so I look forward to just joining the conversation as we move forward. I should have given it to you before we published it. That's, that was really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, great. Um, Fatima, we are just lucky uh, to have her here. <laughs> she is uh, an activist from Borno State who's been here uh, with Search for Ground, for Common Ground, uh, for the UNGA meetings. We learned that she was in town while we were having this panel, and we thought uh, uh, how great to be able to bring you on, um, have your thoughts on um, some of the challenges we've been talking about, both the impacts of violent extremism. Uh, but also kind of what people are debating at the local level in terms of solutions. So thank you so much, Fatima, for joining us. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Indeed, uh, it was quite timely and a great opportunity to share some of the experience and maybe uh, talk also across the report I just had. Unfortunately, I was an opportunity to really have it before I am here. 
But then, uh, based on the uh, short presentation and uh, prior discussions, I was able to like uh, get a sneak peek at uh, of what the re uh, report outcomes is. Um, it was really a wonderful report and a wonderful research. But then, uh, my basic concern, obviously, uh, as my colleague here uh, discussed, was uh, basically uh, there was no uh, kind of reasons or the root causes of this uh, violent extremism, but rather we focus on how they really expand or how uh, they are really happening uh, right now on the ground. So, and uh, it's quite important to actually also look at the drivers, why those things are really happening and what is the connection between it's happening and uh, what we are really doing on ground and how is the response from international partners and donor agencies and the uh, US government, of course, affecting the life of uh, the people, the victims, and also how is it really uh, kind of uh, promoting uh, peaceful coexistence and ra uh, rather than really countering it, how do we prevent uh, future occurrences? Because uh, the reality on ground right now is we have faced what we have faced in the northeast Nigeria, specifically Borno State and Meiduguri to be particular. Uh, but then the problem uh, we are foreseeing that is really, really coming now is greater than even what we have already uh, experienced in the Boko Haram phase. Uh, looking at it that uh, just roughly for like an estimate having 49,000 orphans right now based on assessment, it's a huge number. They are unaccompanied. We don't have an idea where their families are. We don't have an idea if there is any existing relatives. There are 49,000 in number and what happens to them? Some of them are Boko Haram children, some of them are victims' children, so it's like there is a kind of commotion or rather tension uh, between parties and communities and uh, everyone in, uh, on ground. So uh, based on my research, uh, though at the local level and the interaction of my activities, which uh, usually do with the CVE and uh, the radicalization programs, I'm opportune to meet with many young people and then uh, I'm able to actually reach out to the grassroots uh, people and then they are the people really in this problem because uh, they have been faced with the trauma, they are the ones that are being displaced, they are the ones that really, really felt the magnitude of what is really happening. So, and then uh, my research concluded on, we have been looking at many causes of violent extremism, specifically looking at it from the angle of unemployment, on education, uh, lack of education, resources. But I feel there's a major, major thing we are forgetting. The disconnect, the information, the communication. This is like a total locked down with the grassroots. They really do not have the information I and you have. They really do not have the connection with the uh, appropriate agencies that are acting on their behalf. And rather, they really do not have the information of what is really happening within and outside their communities. So it's like this wide gap and the wide disconnect between the information that the actors, the government agencies, the CVE actors, it's very wide. So looking at it from that perspective, I feel young people, of course, are the uh, larger group of uh, violent extremists, but why? And why is because of the neglect? Why is because we make the decision for them at the top level? We say, this is okay for you young people, you have to do this, but no. I'm a young woman, I've met series of young people, I am in that category and really, really understand how they think and how they feel towards situation, but it's like we push it to them. And then the more we push it to them, the more harder it becomes for them to really accept it. Uh, I give an example quickly. For instance, the US uh, government decided to uh, give aid to Nigerian government of a million dollars. And then it's all over the internet that the US government has given Nigerian government a million USD for humanitarian activities. That's the news. I get the news, you get the news, so does everyone. And how the news travels faster is overwhelming. 
because you would be surprised to go to the grassroots and you hear the Nigerian government received two million aid because they are helping you. It's one million that was in the news, but before it gets to them, it's two million. And then another person from another place, because the government is now quiet about the information and does not really want to share why and how they really get the resources from the US government, another person will say, it's two million, and then government stole 1.5 million out of the two million. And originally, it's a million. So now an average gra grassroots person that really did not have uh, information of what is really, really the actual uh, amount received, had the impression it's two million, and then had that impression that 1.5 million out of the two million is stolen. Of course, it's, uh, it's believable, because the government did not tell me they received it, and in fact, they didn't tell me they're using it for so-so and so-so and so-so. So there is a disconnect. And then another person as an extremist leader will come to say, see, the Nigerian government is stealing 1.5 million and just sending uh, like 500,000 out of it to you, and you have to fight for your right. And everybody feels he's responsible to fight for his right. So there is a connect between the recruit of violent extremists and the grassroots level than what we have from the government and the grassroots level. So it's obvious that these connections will have to be mend. It's like we have to do more of the grassroots work than what we are doing at the top level. We have conferences, it's good. We have meetings, it's good. But I am only able to share what I know or what I get from the little I get in the society. But they are the problems, uh, uh, they are the ones facing the problem, they are the ones with their solution, and we need to involve them more before making the decision for, our, for, for, for them. So I think there is more of the high level meetings and high level conferences than really, really what is going to, to the grassroots level. That's one on the communication gap. And I feel it is really important to really seal that uh, gap because if we don't seal it, the extremists will seal it for us. They have already been doing it. The Boko Haram recruitment was crude. They went door to door they went village by village to actually preach to most of these young people, and then they gain followers. Because they make it uh, your own project, they make it, this is fighting for you, and everyone wants to fight for himself. So it's more like they do it strategically than we do it because of the involvement and the connection on, uh, on the grassroots level. Then another thing of concern to me is the humanitarian uh, assistance. Of course, there is the humanitarian assistance, and a lot of development partners have tripped into the northeast Nigeria. But let's think of it. We still hear of malnutrition cases. We still hear of hunger. We still hear of people die of health. And then we have like 41 uh, NGOs with UN agencies coming to our aid. What is wrong? Why is this gap so wide? We cannot cater for everyone, of course, because it's, it's actually a huge challenge to have like over two million people displaced, and then not only the displaced people, but then even the host communities hosting some of these displaced IDPs could be even called IDPs themselves. Because one way or the other, you have a family of seven, and you ended up catering for 50 more people because your grandmother moved in with you, her friend moved in with you, your uh, uncle's nephew moved in with you because they do not have a home. So the responsibility has piled up on you and the, you, you are so overstretched and so is everyone in the neighborhood who supports who. So the humanitarian assistance we are getting, of course, is for the IDPs, but we have to split it into like little portion for everyone to have. I've been opportune to be part of uh, food distributions, food aid from philanthropists and organizations. Trust me, if you go for assessment of how to share this food, it's overwhelming because technically everyone now is a victim and you, have, you cannot just say, you're not IDP, you don't need it, because it shows on his face that he really needs it. We have official camps, we have unofficial camps, places where people just decide to settle for asylum, places where people call homes that are really not home. So the assessment and the skills of the interventions or the level of assistance we are getting is 
less than what the people really need because technically all of us in the state are hungry because we don't have anything to do. For example, we are, we are people that farm. Farming is our basic uh, business. Farming is what we do to live. And then we do not have a, a, a land anymore to farm because we are scared of explosives or we are scared of we don't know where to meet Boko Haram. You don't know where to get attacked today. You don't know. So it's like we've been confined in a place. We cannot do anything. The little people among us that are running little business now have to support one another to eat. So eating is just the priority now, talking about development. So on the humanitarian assistance, I think a lot of things have to be emergency in our own case. We understand there are rules of emergency uh, humanitarian uh, assistance. They are the basic, basic. But trust me, even livelihood sounds emergency to us. It's an emergency. We, are, we, we have other local governments that are being returned by the state government because they are not like uh, so much destroyed. Even though the English said uh, it has to be willingly and uh, they have to really want to go back. But is it really possible for us to, to just wait until everyone really, really wants to go back when people are used to free food People are used to free treatment. It's like the camp is just a, a, a free place to live. Do we really have the resources to keep these people until everyone says, yes, I am ready to go back home? We really do not. We have to encourage them. We have to support them and make them understand that going back is the actual solution to our problem, one. Second, reintegration. Looking at the reintegration phase, it's going to take us like years for people to really get ready for reintegration. What are we doing for the community people to be ready for reintegration? They're not ready. We have series of meetings with uh, the, 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 the stakeholders, with the people, and then the first impression about reintegration is, we know when you people start talking about reintegration, you mean amnesty, you mean dialogue. So what happens to me that Boko Haram people killed my father, killed my uncle, slaughtered my sister, and you be coming here to say we have to talk with them or even give them some, some sort of amnesty. So it's like, no, no amnesty for Boko Haram. People are not ready. There has to be a total reorientation and sensitization for everyone in the community because, of course, we are psychosocially <laughs> imbalanced. Because technically everyone is running mad with vengeance, with grief, with a lot of things. But then what psychosocial support do we need? That matters to us. Uh, I will talk like a Nigerian, just uh, briefly. <laughs> because uh, psychosocial support for you people really, really is different from what I need, I'm sure. Because a typical white man could be uh, under uh, traumatic disorder and then need some counseling or some talking, some motivation for him to actually get to pull himself back together. But trust me, myself, I don't even know what the trauma, trauma means. Like, I don't even know how I get into trauma. I don't even have, uh, have an idea if this is really uh, traumatizing or it's not. I just have to wear the same face again and life goes on. So believing that you can just come with a counseling session to just make me mentally stable again, it really doesn't work with me as a black person. And trust me, it's like that with my people. Because we do not even believe in like this talking or counseling session or stuff like that. Most uh, NGOs, when they come into my degree and say, uh, Fatima, you know, we want to give uh, psychosocial support to your people. And then because of the trauma and I was like, Seriously? So what is that psychosocial support means? <laughs> so a lot of them will say it's just like a counseling session to sit with them and uh, get this safe space and then talk. I said, look, for you to really, really waste your time on that or the resource you really, really write to, to get and come and talk to me like that, it's better you just split this money and just give everyone ten ten nada and everyone is happy and the trauma is off. So it's like, it's like that with us black people. We don't really need to wallow to, to get over problems. So it's very, very much easier 
to really build on livelihood back for them, support them economically, give them startups, open the market for them really, than sitting with them in a session to, to talk. Because they do not even want to listen and the impression is these white people are coming here to now really, really change our way of doing things, to really change our ideas. So the interventions have to be as local as ourselves. We are the local people, we work with the local uh, people, we know how local we could get to actually get the support for our people. Then lastly, I would like to touch on partnerships and who does what. It is really important that uh, local organizations are involved. But because of the standards of how donor agencies really, really give their funds out, it's very difficult for the grassroots and local organization to even tap a little out of the resources that is being dispersed all over. A lot of young people, a lot of people doing amazing work, a lot of people supporting IDPs, a lot of people doing their best on the grass, but unfortunately, they do not have access to the resource, and the resource is there. So what do we do for these local organizations, for these CSOs that are really doing amazing work to improve on their work and have access, or let's say more access to the grassroots people? It's just to, to mitigate some of the criteria and some of the rules or some of the uh, regulations by the donor agencies. It's like we're not asking for more, but then we're just asking for a little that would enable us to do our work better. And this is like getting a proposal from us that is our own standard, that is our own. We cannot compete with Mexico. We cannot compete with IRC. They are established but we are doing what we are doing at the local level, and definitely we need support as well. And then I want to touch a little on my work with Search for Common Ground, of course an amazing organization. Uh, I'm only two weeks old with them, but it feels like two years already because I, I have to get into the work. Uh, we are organizing a summit in five African countries to actually look at the root causes of uh, violent extremism in the youth perspective. So the, the one uh, uh, summit is going to happen in May degree because we try as much as possible to take it to where the problem is, like the origin and the genesis of the problem. So we are going to have it at the end of October or November, and then I am coordinating uh, the project. And we are going to have it with other four uh, countries, and we are going to have it in all of the four countries as well, so making it five. And the outcome is strictly uh, young people perception towards uh, CVE, their work, their recommendation, and how we could integrate and also uh, kind of escalate youth government partnership in, in that level as well. So uh, thank you very much. I won't bore you much, but trust me, I have enough or a lot more to share with you, but this is just like, the scope. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. And you're definitely not boring us. This is clearly the tremendous value you get from the local perspective. So very fortunate to have you uh, on the panel today. So we'll go next to Madeline Rose, and um, we will hear about your most recent report, and I think maybe a previous report and some other elements of this. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, and so Mercy Corps, we're also an international NGO or civil society organization, so uh, I wish we could have flown one of our, our local staff uh, to come speak, but I will do my best to reflect uh, our, our team's perspectives. Um, Mercy Corps has worked in Nigeria since 2011, uh, and we just started our first, we just opened our first Northeast office. Uh, so we work in 10 states now. We've been working on conflict mitigation and reduction on p former pastoral violence principally uh, since 2011, and this will be opened our Maiduguri office just in August, but I've been work doing research up there for the last 18 months. Um, but yeah, just to thank CSIS first for the report. I know uh, Jen and Tom met with some of our local researchers and enumerators for this study in particular. Um, and so it's, it's nice to see that sort of close the loop. Um, I think we're particularly grateful for the strong emphasis in the report on making the connection between sort of the political um, concern with terrorism and violent extremism and the direct relationship between structural vulnerabilities that are inherently developmental. Therefore, if you care about terrorism, government X, 
and you recognize that the drivers of terrorism are under development and bad governance, therefore you need to deploy developmental solutions to address terrorism. That spectrum uh, is still very difficult to make clear to sort of the, the policy world. Uh, so we really appreciate that you did that so eloquently um, and uh, in a way that not a lot of reports have done. Um, so I'm going to kind of live in the middle of, of the first two speakers, uh, and I thought I'd anchor my comments in, in a quote from the report's executive summary. Um, since I'm a policymaker, but we're a practitioner, I'm kind of going to say, okay, well, taking all of this analysis, what, what can you actually do about it? What, what, how do you take the uh, analysis into a program design? Um, so the, the kind of quote that stuck with me was at the end of the, the, the executive summary ends with a quote saying, an immediate priority must be to fortify the countries of the region against possible spillover from Libya and the Middle East, to prevent violent extremist organizations from regenerating, period. The more difficult task, however, will be to tackle the political and socioeconomic drivers of criminality and conflict that underpin violent extremism. Um, so this quote is particularly useful for, I think, reflecting on the state of the countering violent extremism field today, right? It's two, we have two principal questions driving our problem set, which is one, how can, we how can we prevent individuals from joining violent extremist organizations today and tomorrow? That sort of fits the preventing regeneration bucket. Uh, and then how can we address the drivers that we know could make people more uh, vulnerable to recruitment in 10 years or vol voluntarily joining in 10 years? So for my remarks, I'll talk a little bit about Mercy Corps' global research. Um, we've done research on the sort of drivers to violence and community resilience to violent extremism over the last 10 years. Uh, and then I'll use a Nigeria case study um, for my recent trip there. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about Nigeria, Mali, Libya. So we work in um, Mali, Niger, and Nigeria, and we're currently reassessing reentry into Libya. We were there throughout the 2000s. So happy to take more country-specific questions, but just thought for the discussion would be more sort of thematic. Um, so as we sort of enter in the problem set of, okay, how do we start, start, start to tackle these drivers? Um, you know, Mercy Corps has invested a lot of time in researching the drivers and what drives kind of at that individual and community level um, because it, it does feel that there's a lot of assumptions driving, driving the field. Um, so both globally um, and in the Sahel. Uh, so we've done research over the last 10 years in Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, uh, and some of our sort of big five drivers uh, and processes on the individual community level that I think corroborate some of the findings of the report. Um, so five big takeaways that I think are most pertinent. One, there is no single profile of uh, a terrorist or a violent extremist. Um, in Nigeria in particular, we found some people who joined were very rich, some were very poor. Uh, some had attended secular school, some had attended a religious school. Um, some had worked in the government previously, some had not. Uh, I should add, to in our research, we've interviewed over 60 former members of Boko Haram over the last 18 months. So that, that kind of, that picture, and we, we emphasize that, we know that might sound obvious, but we emphasize it because it's really important for policymakers to realize that it is not a strategic use of time or money to focus on needle and a haystack approaches and high value target focus on the problem set of violent extremism. It is simply not going to give you an ROI on your time spent. It is much more strategic to focus on the systemic policy. Um, and that's why we, we say that over and over and over again, because there is no individual you can trace. You just, there's been no mo models for prediction yet. Uh, so second, um, which is very strong in the report, um, but broad frustrations with corruption, inequality, and injustice create the community conditions for support for Boko Haram. So that experience of injustice, that sense of neglect, that sense of marginalization that comes so strongly in, out in the report, we, our research has corroborated that that is generally the, most, the strongest recruitment narrative. In some of our reports, we have a lot of quotes about sort of corruption, neglect. In, in Nigeria, I was particularly struck um, by the relationship between people, uh, kind of this gets to the question of use perception uh, and use ability to get ahead. So if they want to, to open a business, if they want to start a job, if they want to go to school, and they don't have that opportunity, they connect that with a sense of systemic injustice that relates to government corruption or neglect. So, it's th so that's where there's that blurred line for your question about sort of economic drivers and unemployment and governance. If you don't have the ability to pursue your own ambitions, whether they be financial or whatever those ambitions are, and you blame the government or you, or you have a recruiter blaming the government for your, for your grievance, that's what can, that's what makes that sort of ecosystem in which it's easier to be recruited or we find an increase in recruitment. So very closely linked to that, um, 
the, the, the next biggest correlate we found next to sort of governance neglect is exposure to violence. So exposure to violence is the strongest indicator we've ever found in Mercy Corps um, for future propensity to violence. So that underscores the recommendation for civilian protection to be a huge priority uh, in CVE policy, uh, as well as just the broader argument for ending wars and reducing violence. Um, because whether a citizen, you know, in, for example, in, anywhere we worked in the world, in South Sudan is where we've seen the highest rates of support for, for violence. That's a country that has suffered, you know, violence for 40, 50 years, recurrent civil war over and over and over again. There's also been a lot of study by academics at Yale um, on the relationship between exposure to drones or visibility of drones or military action and support for violence. So that, that kind of, it's a natural, it's a, a natural logic that we can all relate to that if you've seen violence, if you've grown up in a violent environment, you're actually more prone to participate in violence. Um, but we actually have extensive research that kind of uh, empirically validates that assumption. Fourth, um, recruitment into violent extremist organizations defies the logic of voluntary and forced. Uh, and so we emphasize that, we found that a lot in the Sahel in particular, that there's sort of, you know, across uh, a person's lifetime, um, there could be various points, various challenges that they, uh, that they encounter um, that make them more susceptible to recruitment. Um, with, with Boko Haram in particular, it was sort of this series of people who tried to resist. So they, they might have been recruited, someone knocked, Boko Haram knocked on their door in 2011, they said no. In 2012, they said no again. In 2013, when Boko was controlling more territory and their only, act, their only ability to sort of main, to keep their, their livestock herd, for example, was to agree uh, to collude in some way with Boko Haram's demands they might have made that decision then, right? So it's, it's sort of, you, you, they then could fall into the choice spectrum um, or the voluntary spectrum, but that's all, there's also been a series of, of forced circumstances. Um, and so just we, we caution against that binary uh, of forced, and I think in Nigeria it's super problematic with the, uh, the government's response to de-radicalization um, and, and sort of how they're rounding up particular persons associated in some way with Boko Haram. Uh, if we perpetuate that black and white um, breakdown, it kind of justifies a, a harder, a crackdown approach, which we think is problematic. Uh, so the, the fifth big takeaway of our research is that violent conflict causes violent extremism more than violent extremism causes violent conflict. Uh, and we think that's very important to continue to emphasize with policymakers that yes, violent extremism is very destructive um, and it's causing, adding a lot of new dynamics to the sort of global security environment and the development environment. Um, but we would be, we would caution policymakers against thinking VE is the primary overarching problem and that conflict follows, it's the reverse, right? So ongoing wars that have been unresolved have created the vacuums in which ISIS and AQIM have been able to come to power. Uh, so focusing on ending violent conflicts and taking a conflict reduction lens is actually going to get you to your VE dividends more likely, more successfully than the reverse. Um, so those are some of our sort of global findings. Um, again, on the Nigeria research specifically, uh, we did two studies over the course of 2015 and 2016 on the drivers to Boko. The big takeaways were sort of the inequality and in, um, perception of corruption and bad governance was sort of the community, created the community acceptance. And then Boko Haram had a pretty sophisticated uh, financial, um, uh, financial services scheme for recruitment. So I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A if anyone's interested or we have reports. Um, so that's kind of our, our background from sort of the INGO perspective. Uh, the, so, so what? So what do we do about that? Um, in Mercy Corps' uh, sort of Sahel strategy, we think that the role of the practitioner, the role of the INGO, um, or at least our chosen sort of strategy in the Sahel for now, is to focus on increasing the, cap the capacities of local, national, and regional organizations and actors to reduce violent conflict. Um, and that if communities are able to reduce and be resilient to violent conflict, um, they can mitigate against all forms of violence, right? So whether it's criminal violence, whether it's political violence, whether it's mass atrocities, whether it's sort of systemic human rights or ethnic cleansing, like whatever the type of violence is, if you increase and you build that sort of architecture and that peace build, those peace building capacities um, that Fatima mentioned, you're, you're more able to reduce all forms of violence of concern. Um, so what does that actually look like in real 
uh, practical terms, sort of I'll give an overview of our Nigeria CVE program. So it's a, a pilot program that we just started in the Northeast. It's working in my degree. Um, it's all through local civil society organizations. Um, Mercy Corps is really just the financial facilitator of subgrants. Uh, so we can deal with the administrative burdens to USAID, but then local organizations get to do all the actual hard work. Um, and so it has four, it's a, it's a four prong program. Uh, underpinning that is sort of this idea of addressing those drivers of, okay, how do you change the relationship between citizens and state? How do you start to give youth opportunity? And how do you do it in a way that engenders and promotes the social contract um, to start to address these feelings of chronic neglect? Um, so the act, there's four lines of activity. The first is to strengthen civil society's uh, capacity around advocacy. Uh, and research in particular. So I thought a lot of what Fatima was saying about um, you know, having youth-led and local-led research, um, a lot of local civil society organizations don't have the access to research capacities or research tools or research methods. Um, and we also found, found as, as Fatima so well articulated, that the, the sort of space for dialogue right now in the Northeast, as, as well as in Mali, around collusion, amnesty, um, you know, who was involved and who wasn't, there's really, really a lack of a, a shared narrative uh, based on of what happened in the crisis that is really needed in order to move forward on these issues of reconciliation. So focusing on advocacy and organizing capacities is the first pillar. Connecting that advocacy uh, to good governance programming. So we're facilitating conversations for civil society, in particular youth, to engage with the government, both the local, uh, nas the local state and national government, around President Buhari's recovery plan for the Northeast and around the Office of National Security's um, CBE plan. So facilitating that process of citizens being able to ex express their opinions, demand oversight, and to be engaged in the policy process. Um, third, the third pillar of the program uh, is on uh, enabling youth to fulfill their economic ambitions. So it's a sort of financial services youth employment program. Uh, and then the fourth is specifically looking at grassroots narrative. So how do you start to bring sort of more visibility to conversations of dialogue and, um, and reconciliation across the, across the region so that more people are engaged in that process as, as was mentioned. So that's kind of the program. I just hope it's helped. I know I'm a policy person. I hope it's, I think sometimes we don't actually have that tangibility of like what do all these words mean. So I just thought I would give a case study of a program. Um, but I'll really quickly do sort of policy recommendations if I have time. Super quick. Super quick. Uh, so. He's the Lester Holt of the. Yeah, I'll just say the topic sentence. <laughs> So super quick, sort of big picture on what this means for both CVE policy and sort of Sahel policy. On CVE, three main points. Please keep driving the momentum towards CVE and PVE. Um, we have been advocating sort of for more proportional investments in the global war on terror uh, for, for years and years and years. This is the closest we've ever been to actually moving money and actually moving policy towards the root causes of violence. So please keep that drumbeat. It has changed things significantly on the ground. Um, CVE is now a real thing, and we want to keep that pr productive momentum. Second, uh, if we get the policy right, we really need to start we're advocating to sort of put money where our mouth is on conflict. Um, within overall government spending on foreign aid, under 1% goes to conflict mitigation and peace building, despite the fact that conflict occupies about 90% of our diplomatic conversations. We really just don't invest in these types of programs, so we are advocating for a uh, doubling of investments by 2018. Uh, and then on Sahel policy, uh, three things. One, we're urging all Sahel governments to commit to uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16, uh, which specifically would require them to commit to measuring reductions in violence and levels of violence within their country, including state actions of violence. So, they, so all governments would be forced to measure against homicide reductions, levels of, of, of uh, violation against their citizen population. So everything under SDG 16. Uh, two, just to focus money on civil societies, everything Fatima was saying, uh, so much money is being lost into the hands of governments. So much of the multilateral money is never seen and never benefits the civilian population. So really getting money to civil society and CVE. Uh, and then um, third, 
kind of to our, our colleague's comment from the National Guard, uh, just a strong um, push towards these governments to be more proportional about their civilian and military investments when, we, when it comes to CT and CVE. And your comment about sort of what can the U.S. do and what role does the historical narrative play, I think the model that we make, if we as the U.S. government still spend 95 percent of our counterterrorism dollars on military and only 5 percent of civilians, it makes it very difficult for the State Department to then go tell allies that they should be using more civilian methods to reduce violent extremism. It is very hypocritical, and that hypocrisy is not lost on our allies. So if we're more proportional, we can help make the world more proportional and address the root causes. Excellent. Right. No, that's fantastic, Madeline. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to Najla Amangush, who is going to bring us uh, a little bit north of this and talk about Libya and its impact. Great. Thanks, Najla. OK. And just let me know to advance. OK. So um, can you just take it to another slide? Well, thank you. Thank you for Tom and Jennifer for inviting me for this significant event. Um, my contribution, actually, I will just focus a little bit about the rule of Tuareg in Libya uh, after, uh, before and after the revolution, and then also what's happening now these days regarding to ISIS and the Islamic State and the extremism in Libya. So I can go to the first slide. Uh, this map actually available online, but I was thinking it's very interesting to look to the dynamic when it comes to the ethic, uh, ethics group in, uh, in Libya. So we can see the Tuareg and the Tabu where they have a big conflict between each other, uh, and both of them, they're barbarian. Um, no, not both of them. Tuareg is barbar, uh, barbar and uh, Tabu, they came from uh, North Chad and also from Sudan. And uh, the history of Tuareg and Tabu in Libya since, be, you know, before the revolution and how Gaddafi treated those different ethnic groups, it's really matter when it comes to the situation now on the ground in Libya. Back to what uh, all the panelists said, like the historical, you know, uh, narrative that happens during this uh, 42 years, it's really excluded those two ethnic groups from what's going on in Libya. Um, and when you look to the map, really, us, like we consider the Arab who live in the coast, like Benghazi and Tripoli and, you know, Derna and Sirte, we're really very far from what's going on down in the desert. We have no connection, you know, like if I'm going to talk about myself, I've never been in the desert before. So it just gives you imagination, like really we don't know what's going on in terms of the dynamics and the situation there. So if we're going to uh, talk about the Tuareg, the Tuareg, as I said, like they speak the language that links them to the Berber. Um, there's a very large group, uh, and they, they're reaching many countries, Algeria, Mali, and Niger, as well in Libya. Uh, and really, we need to think, when you think about the Tuareg, we need to think about the social and political uh, circumstances about those ethical group, uh, ethics group, uh, ethnic groups. Sorry. So what kind of political and social history and complexity they bring to the region these days within the situation in Libya, especially after the revolution. Also, the, when we see about the population of the Tuareg, like there are more than one million in Niger, and then uh, and you can correct me, uh, but this is just based on some numbers. And also in Mali, like around 900,000, smaller number in Algeria and then Burkina Faso, but also in the Libya, they are very small population. They are around uh, 20,000. And this was like very old statistic in 1993, I guess. But that should explain how they are moving. They are really mobilizing. They're moving from place to other. So so difficult really to have this specific number when it comes especially in Libya. The other ethnic group, and I thought like it's important today to highlight them, the Tabu, because again, the conflict now in Libya, part of what's going on, the conflict between the two, those largest group now. So the Tabu is, is also uh, in inhabiting northern in Chad and also in southern Libya. Um, uh, most of them, they come from Sudan also. They speak the Saharan language. Uh, although the Tuareg also need to think about now when the situation and, and in Libya when it comes to this uh, Islamist group and when the Dignity Movement decided in May 2015 to start establish, you know, this war against the extremism, there is uh, uh, two different... Uh, you know, uh, reaction to this uh, involvement. So the Tabu, actually, the majority of them, they decided to join the Dignity Movement and support, you know, Hefter and his alliance to be part of this war. 
Tabu, they was uh, Tuareg, they was divided between both of them. Some of them, they were with dignity movement, but the majority was against that. So this circumstances, this situation explain also the complexity within the situation these days. So again, back to Gaddafi before the revolution. Gaddafi actually tried to manipulate and try to use the Tepo and also the Tuareg as, a, as excluded uh, groups in Libya. Uh, so for example, in Gat, where is the north, uh, uh, where is the southwest in Libya, there is like, uh, they used a lot of them for intelligence services and, you know, uh, and to work with them for their purposes. Also, they try to reach out to Niger and Mali and try to, you know, manipulate the groups there and say, hey, we'll help you to, to sustain up some peace there and st stability, and they give them some promises to be part of the Libyan identity. So all these, you know, history and all these situations was really now explain a lot what's going on. The Tuareg also youth they have been very hard situation economically. They, uh, they are really, really, as, as, as Tom and Jennifer, Jennifer uh, said, they really uh, rely on the trafficking. They rely on, you know, drugs and guns. And this is, this is the only way they survive and they control the desert, uh, especially they have this uh, experience with this, you know, uh, uh, the, the wide range of deserts and the border. Uh, so, again, the increased fighting for the Tuareg and, and, and Tabu, especially during the revolution, it was really uh, significant. Uh, but sometimes as a Libyan, as you know, we didn't really even realize how it's really complex and, you know, uh, very rooted in, in the situation, especially when it comes to the oil fields. Uh, and, 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 and again, like I told, like, because the Tabu really uh, largely uh, aligned with dignity movement. So there's also this kind of fighting for resources and fighting for, uh, you know, uh, lines that they feel more empowered to, to be uh, with. Again, back to the Tuareg, it's very interesting to, when we talk about the Tuareg to understand uh, the Tuareg identity. So even as us as a Libyan, most of the time when we talk about the Tuareg, we have this blame that they support Gaddafi. But really when you go and research more about the Tuareg as, as a community, as a group, they have this loyalty issue. So for example, because they have this hierarchy system where they have the leaders above them, they have a huge respect and admire to any person who try to help them or support them. So the way how Gaddafi find the way to support the Tuareg over the years, that's established this relationship between the two especially when he started promising them to have a Libyan identity and more education resources and access to resources, you know, in the ground. So that's actually established this kind of relationship. And the Lib Libyans, especially in the coast, they don't understand that because they feel like, no, they should be against Gaddafi. But when you, when you see this history of discrimination and history of lack of access, then it's so difficult, you know, to understand, uh, you know, their situation. Uh, also, there is like independent movement happens in the, in the late 80s and 90s, where those Tuareg try really to establish the source of identity and try to, you know, have this uh, sense of uh, uh, autonomy to, to work together and to establish their identity in the Sahara region. The other slide, please, because I already say that. So the question is, what's the relationship between the Qaeda and Tuareg? There is a lot of stories about the Tuareg maybe be involved in Qaeda or ISIS in Libya, or if they are really there, the ISIS. Uh, but again, uh, the reason why a little bit explain, in short, the history of Tuareg and Tabu, because really, if we understand that, then we're gonna understand what kind of rule they are working, what they are doing now in Libya, like what kind of position for those uh, tribes uh, in the desert where they, where they don't have really a lot of options, uh, what, what they gonna do when it comes to the ISIS and the collaboration with Al-Qaeda. So, you know, the Tuareg have no organized link with Al-Qaeda, yet the Tuareg were also having to cope with it because there is many damage happened, you know, uh, they lost the animals, they destroyed them, they're also by the Niger military. The anti-Qaeda measures also uh, include great uh, restriction for Tuareg mobility, uh, causing all these difficulties. Then the Tuareg, uh, they kind of, uh, their cope, cope with this mechanism they help them to, you know, more trafficking and, you know, to um, 
bring guns and support them with this, with this kind of strategy within the region or within the Libya. Especially, they, they lost their sense of identity when it comes to the nation and as a Libyan. So what kind of uh, you know, behavior we, we're going to accept from them? So why ISIS in Libya? It's not surprising that we have ISIS in Libya. It's not only just for the Tuareg or what's going on in the Sahel. Actually, Libya, since 2011, we have this political vacuum. We have this revolution where we have, you know, one, we don't have one single unity government. Uh, we have the division between the East and the West, especially when it comes to security issues, uh, the absence of rule of law, as many people suggested, you know. Uh, Al-Qaeda, also the Islamic State, both, both of us, they have... They consider Libya as a safe haven for them um, because of these political vacuums and also how that affects the neighbors around. Um, again, uh, also there is a, a other phenomena. There is many, many foreign jihadists. They are now in Libya. And especially the big, number, the big names, the big leaders, they come from Tunisia, from Afghanistan, uh, from Yemen. So also there's how we're going to deal with this, especially when the country is out of control. Uh, the, the last one, which is also very important when it comes to the conversation of trafficking, the black market as well, uh, the network in Libya, and, and how the economic drivers also have been really uh, 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 a big reason behind all this, uh, you know, issue. There's also another one just to explain. This is a recent one, I think, in 2015, a map where they tried just a little bit to describe, you know, where is ISIS? in terms of the map of Libya, you know, now and where they are most located. So Derna, as we know, uh, in the east, very close to Egypt. So this is the major city where they uh, declare the wilaya uh, for the Islamists. And then you have al Baida, and then you have Benghazi, where you have some core of ISIS there, where the, the, the fighting is still happening. I mean, al Baida, no, but in Benghazi. Also, you have CERT, where now recently occupied by, uh, you know, not recently, 2015, but there is still fighting going on between, you know, uh, ISIS and different, uh, you know, uh, groups from Musrata and from Tripoli as well. So this is just to explain what's going on in the Sahel, you know, in the, in the coast, even, you know, we know the complexity with the, in, the, in the south as well. This is just very short timeline, time and uh, it's not about the history in Libya, just about uh, just try to capture ISIS, you know, movement within uh, the, in, in the region. So in September 2012, the Islamist militia, including the Ansar al-Sharia, attacked the consulate in Benghazi, as everybody knows. And uh, that was really, really tremendous change in the Libyan history, especially in Benghazi, and was a really dangerous sign that the situation will really dramatically change. Uh, and I remember I was there during that time, and then the same month where there's a big, big demonstration like for nonviolent, more than 4,000 people in Benghazi Street, they, they come up with under the Logan Save Benghazi where there, many people, they really start feeling the threat and the fear that there, really, there is some kind of major change happening. August 2013, the, the, the Petroleum Defense Guards shut down and all export, which is really also a big issue when it comes to the Tuareg and when it comes to the desert. And, and also in October 2013, the prime minister have been kidnapped. This is a sign, like even the political elite, they don't have any custody. They, they are not secure because there is also revolution or, or militia groups around where they can control the situation. May 2014, General Hefter start uh, launched the Operation Dignity against ISIS. Then 2014, UN staff and foreign diplomats evacuated. And this is really a big issue for us. It's not more about evacuation. It's more about the rule of civil society. It's more about the funding. It's more about the donors. It's more, it's more about the grassroots level. Because since that time, grassroots level or, uh, you know, real work uh, in Libya, it was really struggle. Because you can't access there and everybody evacuated. So the security issue is a really a big deal now. Uh, again, October 2014, ISIS declared first Libya, Wilay and Derna, and then ISIS captured Sirte, and then, uh, uh, you know, Derna and Shura Council in 2015, where Abu uh, Salem uh, drives the ISIS out of Derna. And the last one, Abu Nabil, when he was being uh, killed uh, by airstrike outside the Derna. So this just shows, shows the dynamic and the different, uh, you know, even Ansar al-Sharia and then ISIS and Qaeda, all these different names and different hats for one specific strategy, it's like, you know, a bring chaos and crisis in the region. 
So this is the last thing, like, uh, yes, many Libyans now today, they ask for you know, military intervention, and that's happened, in cert. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm really cautious about it because it's really will be even, uh, will be really temporary, and uh, without genuine reconciliation and without broader political and social context, then the situation will be the same. And as everybody said, there is a root causes behind what's going on in Libya. We need holistic approach to build social cohesion for the Libyan as essential political stability as first. We need one unity government. We need, uh, you know, legitimacy where people can really hear to the government. We want Libyan identity crisis now everywhere, not just with the Tabu and the, and the Tuareg. It's even with the Libyan in the, in, you know, who fight against different groups and who have been caused lots of harm that affected the social cohesion for the families and the neighborhoods. Uh, DDR program is really priority now in Libya and happened in 2012, uh, 2012 but was really uh, one of the big failure, I think, for the UN because it was very short timing. Uh, they was ignoring to the reintegration process uh, and they was really superficial in the way how they dealt with this issue without really highlighting the deep causes behind this problem. Last thing, uh, justice reform, even rule of law or justice, indigenous justice mechanism is really needed now in Libya to bring this uh, trust and establish the social cohesion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Najla. Very quickly, I'm going to just jump out and show you the uh, site here, if I can get this to work. to show you the website here. Um, if you go on it, you'll find the, uh, the video you saw as we began at the executive summary. The full report is below that right there for you to access, the photo gallery, and then the podcast Jennifer and I did recently. Supplemental materials, various uh, op-eds, testimonials, and articles, and then a public service announcement by the Nigerian government just as an example of one response to uh, the threat. So from here, we will open it up to questions. We have around 20 minutes uh, remaining, and um, just wait for the microphone. And again, uh, please identify yourself and your affiliation. So in the front here, Nikita, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Blake Souter, I'm in uh, Senator Tim Kaine's office. Uh, I look forward to reading the full report over recess, hopefully after we pass a CR. Um, uh, and also, First off, thank you, Fatima, for that very candid um, description of uh, something that we don't get, especially up on the hill, is uh, a lot of local local insight. Um, I think Madeline hit a little bit of it in terms of what we can do in, with policymakers to address some of these things right now on the ground, but I was wondering if other people could elaborate on that a little bit. Um, and also, are there specific areas that Congress should look at in terms of authorities or lack of authorities that would help enable some of your guys' policy recommendations? Sure, a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. And then the gentleman here. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I enjoyed each of the presenters. I look forward to reading your report. As someone who has run a large CBE program in the Sahel, I want to share just a few of my takeaways. Okay, please be brief, because I will we be don't brief. have a lot of time. Yes, uh, the need for a granular understanding of what are the drivers, the need to better match the intervention with those granular drivers, the need to have flexibility of the program instrument, and also a little bit less risk averse in how we program CBE money. So just as somebody who comes at it from a practical experience standpoint. So thank you for that. And a second question over here. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wenthe with the Air National Guard uh, and at, currently at the National War College. Uh, I recently, recently completed some uh, research that looked at ethnomusicology as a framework for CVE in the Sahel, uh, particularly northern Mali. Uh, and I was really stricken by how, most, how the most nuanced literature I read was, was from uh, people who were involved with music in, in uh, Touareg music or music in, uh, in Mali. Uh, Andy Morgan, who was a manager for Tenari Wen for several years and now is a, uh, 
a journalist. So I was wondering if you if you encountered that in some of your field work, uh, and 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 uh, in, in terms of uh, the role of, of people involved with music in the area, and then also if you could maybe comment on uh, music as a leverage point for CVE, especially in a in a in a culture where it's so foundational to uh, to their culture. Great. Okay, and one more here, this gentleman. Hi, thank you all. Uh, John McCauley, Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland. I just couldn't resist sharing with you that um, some colleagues and I just finished a study um, with data from 8,000 people across Niger, Chad, and Burkina on what causes people to support violent extremism. And what we found is exactly in keeping with Madeline's point, that the number one predictor of why people lend support to uh, violent extremism is violence in their communities. Uh, exposure to conflict, high levels of crime, and so forth. And I don't mean just that violence leads to more violence. I mean that violence leads to support for religious extremism. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take a pause right there. The first question um, dealt with advice to policymakers. I'm going to volunteer Jennifer for that since she did testify before Congress on this and, and had uh, very specific recommendations that she can offer. And I'll also note that Jennifer grew up in West Africa and has some very good comments from that perspective that may touch on the other questions we had over here. Uh, sure. J just on that that last point, I'm, I'd be very interested to hear, too, at the household level, the levels of domestic violence and how that affects. I don't know if that was part of the study, but um, it's kind of something that's uh, uh, kind of fascinated me a bit. Um, in terms of Congress and the authorities, um, look, I think uh, there's going to be a need at some point to move away. I mean, the military is a vital component of any response as people are getting slaughtered in these attacks. But you, you do need to move to something, uh, you know, a, a commu uh, community policing, for example, um, a different model of security, which can be very hard to do in U.S. Uh, development and assistance because of authorities and uh, kind of a hands-off hands approach to policing. Um, you know, policing for so many of these things, whether it's narcotics, whether it's uh, local disputes, uh, uh, whether it's terror, whether it's radicalization, kind of is the first, should be the first front line um, on, on the ground. But it, uh, it, it's often the weakest institution, weakest of security institutions in these countries. So, you know, that's always been a, difficult question for the for the US because it doesn't feel it's good and doesn't have the authorities to do police work but I still think there's it's worth rethinking how best the US can support uh, policing efforts on the ground um, then you know in terms of the Congress and the bully pulpit that the Congress has you know the the crisis that's unfolding right now in the Northeast as I said is it's devastating and it you know it creates it creates the foundation for a future crisis. If you have kids that are out of school for however many years, um, kids that are undernourished, kids that have seen violence, kids that have seen violence in the IDP camps, kids whose mothers have had to engage in transactional sex, for example, for, um, to, to, to make food for their family. Um, so I think you know the Cong there's a lot going on in the world right now, but this is uh, this is a pretty dire situation right now, in one of the absolute poorest uh, corners of, of the world. So uh, that's the other, and then on the diplomatic side, I think the U.S. has to continue to press these governments both to coordinate their efforts and you know on the financing. I think there's skills and capacities the U.S. can bring there to to track financial flows. Um, but you know, at the bottom, the best CVE approach is better governance that connects the state to people and people to one another. And you know, what the one Nigerian said to me, you know, the, the governments want to do this on the cheap. They want to get the military assistance, bring in the military response, and they don't want to change anything that they've ever done. They just want to keep doing what they're doing and expect a different outcome. So how does the U.S. Uh, continue to push on governments to connect better with their people, deliver service better, build those local institutions, and we tend to focus on the national government, build those local government institutions that are kind of where the rubber hits the road. Um, and then uh, finally, 
on one of uh, your points in terms of uh, uh, kind of the different kinds of CVE approaches, one that we saw that was quite interesting, and it goes to the music one as well in a way, uh, was just outside of Gao, about 17 communities, nine of which had sided with the, uh, with the jihadists when they took over the town of Gao and the others not. So the, the communities were in conflict, they didn't speak to each other, the woman from one community didn't, didn't go out. Um, what this OTI program did was kind of begin to introduce the communities to another through boys' soccer matches. And then they grew soccer, they grew the soccer matches. Eventually they, they made uh, kind of uh, kind of communal meals that one community would cook for the other and, and still women were not engaged. It grew other, then the women began to come and engage, then they began a theater group. Um, and I, w I ran into a, a guy, he's a, a Tuareg, he's a development worker in, in the uh, in, in the airport and just asked where he's coming from. I, I said, oh, I, we, saw, we heard about this really cool program of theater and so forth. He said, I was just there. My, my niece was in the theater production. So, I mean, and the, and the community is actually interacting that way. So much of this, I think, uh, is kind of at the granular level, which we couldn't get into in such a broad region. Um, but, but those kinds of solutions that only people really on the ground and people like Fatima can see where the openings are. Um, so we have to be doing a lot more listening um, to people who have solutions at, at that level and, and support them. Thank you. In, in more of the work that Madeline and, and her group has been doing also to actually go out there and do those in-depth granular interviews is, is also, a, a, I think, an excellent compliment to this. Um, I just actually want to uh, respond to uh, Ben's fantastic uh, critique. Jen and I were sitting here going back and forth on, on uh, my phone on why there is such an increase in terrorism here and why now. And some of the things that we came up with are things that are known, but I think it just it bears repeating what some of those issues are. I don't think you can underestimate the collapse in Libya and what it's done in terms of bringing weapons down into this region and bringing people to and from the region. The Mali collapse in the coup is absolutely fundamental to leaving the North even more ungoverned and unguarded than it was before. Uh, the economic and demographic stresses, you're right to point out that they've been there for a long time, but they do increase in some of these areas, don't forget, are, have the lowest um, indicators worldwide in terms of uh, economic development and social development. Social media awareness, there's no doubt about that the threat trajectory has increased in part because of social media and it's just easier to get the messages across to see what's being done, to see what the art of the possible is if you are an extremist. Oh, that's how it was done in Mindanao. That's how it was done in Fallujah. That's how it's done in uh, Kunduz, for example. So social media plays an important role. And don't forget that um, Boko Haram has uh, in a, a relationship with ISIS now. The fundamental area where that relationship has taken place and there's not a lot of uh, traction there, but it's been on the social media side where it's made a difference. Competition between groups. We've seen these attacks in Cote d'Ivoire. We've seen the attacks in Ouagadougou and in Bamako. Now, this is you know, lots of different motivations behind this, but a demonstration of relevance by Al-Qaeda in light of ISIS being at the vanguard of the global jihadi movement is also a source of increased activity, We, I, I believe. Uh, the poor and corrupt government, again, it's been there for a long time, but again, continues to be a good motivation factor and recruitment factor for these groups. The increase in narcotics trafficking uh, that brought in opportunistic groups to engage in the fighting to take control of an area that in Northern Mali in particular, that was under less and less control as uh, the government pulled out. The demonstration effect of ISIS establishing a caliphate is such a stimulant to individuals around the world in terms of wanting to get into the battle. And let's not forget, Saudi money and literature that comes into this region plays a big role. And I'm sure the list could go on from there, but I just wanted to point those out. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing is that, you know, there's always been violence and conflict in this region. Um, and movements, some of them taking on the religious ma mantle, others not. Um, but when you put a kind of infusion over decades of Saudi money, and it's not that uh, Wahhabism leads direct to, to violent extremism, but it does create a, a narrative of us, them, and more pure, less pure versions. And so it, it, it has uh, kind of uh, 
driven some religious divides uh, in there. So the, the money influence uh, and that move towards a uh, kind of more conservative uh, us them form of, of uh, 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 religious form I think has been important. So external drivers, the money of narcotics flows, the money from Saudi, um, the demonstration effect, these external flows layering on top of what is already a pretty conflicted, uh, uh, insecure place. You want to close it out? Right. Yeah, 323. We have time for a couple more questions if people have them. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. This was a, a wonderful afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Nesik. I am a visiting faculty at the Joint Special Operations University in Tampa, and I teach here in the Human Security Program. Um, just um, the last point on um, Saudi money and literature. Um, given the fact that Saudi is dealing with its own issues and Wahhabism doesn't um, really go along with the overall assessment of Saudi money. Um, I, I would just like to have a clarification on that. Uh, but my question is actually um, on two points, uh, particularly Libya. I did my dissertation on Libya, so it's a near and dear to my heart. And I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about what is the future of Libya? This idea of unified ideology of Libyan identity, is it possible given the regionalism, given the tribalism that's constantly being fueled by internal, external factors. And then the second point um, is to Fatima. Um, I really enjoyed and loved the, the level that, um, uh, the, that you went down to, to to talk about the psychology of individuals. And I would like to ask a question whether you think it is possible to rethink the way in which we use Western type of psychology and interventions and work more towards developing programs that will not be rejected by local populations um, that are specifically looking at um, trauma through a cross-cultural perspective um, that is more localized, developing intervention strategies um, developing capacity of local psychologists, healers, conflict analysts, res resolutionists who are going to be able to translate some of the Western-based psychological concepts to fit more within the, the local communities and empowering those actors on the ground. This is something we've been working on with refugees in the Balkans at the moment to develop resilience to specifically um, counter ISIS messaging coming in from Kosovo and other places. So, um, sorry, that's a lot of questions, but I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll, we'll end it there. Uh, Fatima, if you want to respond to that question, and then we'll turn to Najla for the uh, big question, the future of Libya. <laughs> All right, that's uh, great. It's uh, actually a good question and a concern because uh, basically it will be baseless when we keep doing something and it's not giving us the right result, of course. Uh, of course, it's really, really important to really train the local people on ground, uh, like for uh, the translation and for good communication between the grassroots people and them because, of course, uh, it's not like it's a Western, Western thing, but then uh, looking at the beliefs, the culture, the religion, there is uh, a lot of uh, kind of confusion to the grassroots people as to uh, whether this is right or this is wrong. But then, uh, like, for instance, there is uh, this uh, uh, document we're trying to produce right now in Nigeria with an organization that is working towards the counter-narrative of even the Boko Haram ideology. But then uh, my own suggestion on that part went like this. The international human rights laws, the, the human rights laws, the other laws, all the laws are right there in the Quran as well. We all have these laws cross-cutting across all the religions, but unfortunately it is how we send it down to the people that is really confusing them. Because where exactly one law starts, the other one, uh, and sorry, the other one starts. So it's like even in the Quran, there is the 
human right law, that is the law on how a woman and how a man should interact, it's not like it has given uh, more preference to one party over the other, but it's how you really understand it. So when we were doing that document, my suggestion was, let's try so hard using our scholars and prominent uh, imams and pastors to interpret such laws in our own ways of uh, how people see the laws and how it's acceptable to them. In our own language, yes, it's a human right law, but you shouldn't think it's Western because it's also there in the Quran. So we should have like this close uh, reflections to what is acceptable to them and what is uh, in their own uh, belief and culture. So it's actually uh, great. And building the resilience and countering uh, all the narratives, of course, if we do it the local way, like seeing their people and what they believe in, it's not like we are, uh, they see us any better or they see an, uh, us not Western because they all believe we have the Western ideologies on how we operate. But it is better when we translate it to what they actually believe in and then send it to them. It makes more impact and maybe more results, better results as well. Challenging question, I mean, like the future of Libya, but... Um, well, again, like what I said, like, you know, um, first of all, we need to think about Libya in multi-layer, you know, sections. It's not like just one problem that we need to focus on. But I think now Libya needs a good model for leadership, especially in the political level, who can bring the people together, who can use the language that can create a new narrative where the people, they can feel this uh, identity, this, the, you know, the national identity as a Libyan. People felt, you know, now in these days, you know, like really they struggle with their identity when it comes as a Libyan because the, the felt of the, the being proud or being part of this revolution and then after that, you know, the euphoria of the revolution. But again, when you go back and read the history, the you know French Revolution or even the American Revolution. There is a lot of lessons. You know, even the context is different, but the hope is there. Um, one thing I think, like we need, really uh, work so hard in the grassroots level, as Fatima said, as Madeline said. I agree with them, and how to link that in the policy level. You know, and try really to work. Uh, you know, in a way where we can really establish this mechanism to go forward. You know. Uh, but again, I feel like that's really need. The political crisis now, it's huge. And I think we can't do anything without having this unity. Uh, but before the unity, the legitimacy. Because we can't impose it uh, like what's happening these days. So I, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't answer your question, but it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard question. Can I have one small response on the yeah, psychosocial? Just, just one comment. So I definitely don't disagree at all that we cannot export sort of Western systems of anything and assume that's going to work in a local context. Definitely agree with that point. But I do want to say we have been able to measure reductions in propensities towards violence, support propensity and actual participation in violence from people who have experienced violence by going through programming or like peace building programming where there are, where are then where you sort of develop tools about how to process a grievance or an altercation in a nonviolent way. So learning nonviolent dispute resolution as a mechanism of sort of post exposure to violence treatment in a way actually can reduce propensities towards VE. So there are a lot of public health models to interdict that research finding that we know that exposure to violence increases propensity to violence. So we can't just assume that people are going to deal with just to get over that, and that, that, that research finding is all of a sudden going to change if we don't do something about it. So there are a lot of methodologies that are possible to, to, change, to, to alter that trajectory, and I don't, don't want folks to walk away thinking that that's not possible. Thank you, Madeline. Um, folks, we are over our time. I uh, want to thank you for attending and sitting uh, with us for a couple of hours to hear our fantastic panelists, and I'd like to thank each of them for the superb work that they did today and the comments on the report and your offering. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you at the next event.